Thank you, Colin. Good morning. We are at the final sermon in our series, There Is More. And up to this point, we've talked about a couple of things, how God wants, if we want more of him, God wants more of us. We talked about how sometimes when you press into God, you're not immune from suffering and issues in life. And today, before we begin, I wanna ask a few questions just to kind of diagnose where you are today. And so the first question is this. Do you feel honestly that you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I want more of God in my life? Who would say that, honestly? Just raise your hand. I want to experience more of the power of God. Who would say that? I, would, I want to experience, if you're at home, you can do this well. I want, to, I want to experience peace in my conscience before God. Anybody want to experience that? Okay, so I, and that's kind of what I figured. I figured you would say that, but I wanted to ask those questions to you uh, as we began. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is worship, because I think that's what those questions are. W worship is way more than just singing songs, although we do sing songs, and a lot of people think about worship that way. Uh, and I, I don't know if you know this, you were created for worship, uh, God actually is right now in heaven with the angels singing unendingly praises to him for eternity, never getting tired. It's pretty hard to imagine that. And so we were made to worship. We were made to sing. But get this, worship is more than singing. Did you know you worship the Lord through hearing a sermon? It's a way of worship. You worship the Lord through reading the Bible. You worship the Lord when you pray to God. Uh, you worship the Lord when you give your finances or your time or your talents. You worship when you go on a mission. It's an act of service unto the Lord. And so I want to speak, before I get into the, the very heart of worship, I want to speak about two ways that we worship God. And many of us either are engaging in worship or disengaging in worship. And I want to talk about attendance in worship services and attitude in the worship service. Uh, attendance in the worship service, it, it's... Uh, it's not very uh, far out of our mind. We could see it today. I mean, people don't go and worship the Lord like they used to. Uh, and for many of you, worshiping on Sunday, whether in person or online, is not a priority like it used to be. Now, the statistics prove this. If you study some of the research uh, statistics, they will say that 25 years ago, the average member, church member, Christian of a church, would say they go to church or on average 3.2 times a month. So a little over three times a month. And you may miss for vacation or out of town, but normally three times a month you're gonna be in church. Three years ago, that number declined to 1.8 times a month. And now post-COVID or mid-COVID, whatever, we're in COVID right now, three years later, the number has declined. These are church members. These are people who would say, we are Long Hollow. This is our church. 1.2 times a month. Now, that's very different than the church and the religion I was raised in. I was raised in a religion where if you miss church, it was a sin. Uh, as a Catholic, my parents were rule followers, and so we, we actually, if we went out of town for vacation, when we came back in town, we would have to wake up an hour earlier and get to church. Anybody familiar with this? Stand in the confessional line to go to a booth to see a priest behind a barricade, and I would say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been two, three months since my last confession. My sins are, I miss church, right? Now, imagine if we did that at Long Hollow, right? I mean, don't you imagine? We may never have worship service because... No, nah, I'm playing, I'm playing. <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> but seriously, if you had to confess to missing church. Now listen, the Bible doesn't say that missing church is a sin. However, the Bible gives a strong warning against missing the gathering of believers as saints to worship the Lord. I just wanna challenge you to make church worship services, the gathering together with your family, a priority. And reality is, Dad, it rises and falls, the responsibility does, on you. Mom, you're the one. Y'all are gonna give an account to the Lord as to why you engage or disengage in the attendance of a worship service, in person or online. Now, the second issue I wanna talk about is attitude. Our attitude. Now, Jesus is gonna talk about how our attitude toward another person affects our relationship with him, our fellowship with him. But I wanna talk about attitude in the worship service. Did you know during this time, this may be shocking to some, this is not a time to whisper. Did you know that? It's not a time to pass notes. 
It's not a time to text other people or surf the net or play games on your phone, right? Uh, if you're, let me speak to the students for a moment. When you go to Wednesday night service and the preacher is preaching, that is not a time to tell jokes while they're talking. It's not a time to talk about other people. It's not a time to whisper to other friends. It's not a time to look at someone responding to the message and criticize them like, what is the world is wrong with them? That's not that time. You know what that says? By you doing that, it says a lot about your love for and reverence and fear of God. That's what it says. And so our attitude in worship says a lot about the condition of our heart. Now, Jesus is going to show us something surprising here. And what he's going to show us is that the horizontal relationships that we have with other people who are made in the image of God say a lot, visibly, about our relationship with God whom we can't see. The way we treat people whom we can see will be very telling as to the fellowship we have with God whom we can't see. And so if you have a Bible, I hope you do. Turn with me to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter five. Beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five. We'll consider verses 23 and 24. Matthew 5, 23, when you're there. We like to say word. The word of the Lord is Jesus talking. So if you're offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother, or, and by the way, altar is not this, which is why I, I try to, I'm so used to saying come to the altar, but this is not an altar. There was, an, there was one altar, by the way, it was in the Old Testament and it was a barbecue pit, by the way. It wasn't, it wasn't this. So that's why we say come make these steps an altar. An altar is a place you meet God. But this technical altar is not steps. It's a barbecue pit, literally, where they brought the animals to sacrifice. And so this is a man who is going toward the altar with his sacrifice. And he says, when you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Now that terminology is interesting. He doesn't say if you have something against another brother or sister. He says, if your brother or sister has something against you, meaning this is something you did to them. If you offended someone, leave your gift there at the front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother and sister and then come and offer your gift. The word of the Lord. I wanna give you two insights about worship that I think will help us in our relationship and our fellowship with God. Number one is this, you cannot worship God and disrespect people at the same time. You cannot worship God and disrespect people at the same time. Now, Jesus is coming right off the heels of talking about how we treat another person with our attitude. Now, he talks about anger and hatred being similar to murder. And then he kind of he kind of moves into this vivid imagery that the only way we understand it is to take, take us back 2,000 years ago to this time. And so go with me just quickly on a journey. I want to paint a picture of what's happening. Here's the picture. The picture is of a man who is coming up to that beautiful, magnificent temple in Jerusalem with his offering. Now, probably the day of Passover, day of atonement maybe, but probably the day of Passover, and he's waiting in line. And he knows that he has to walk past the first court, which is the court of the Gentiles. Then he walks past the court of women, past the court of men. And then he's coming through to the threshold of the court of the priest, which is where the bronze laver is and the altar and the holy place and the holy of holies. And he's coming to this threshold. And as he's about to enter to the altar to give the gift, he realizes something. Wow, I've wronged someone. And Jesus said, you must do three things. Now, Jesus is gonna show us an insight. It's not stop, drop, and roll, which you should do if you're in a fire. We knew that from school. It's stop, drop, and run. I want you to say that with me because I want you to remember this. Say it with me. Stop, drop, this audience, let's try it again. This audience participation part, by the way. Let's say it again. Stop, drop, and run. Now, what is he saying? Stop what you're doing. Drop the offering now and run to be reconciled. Now, now, what is he talking about? 
The Jewish culture back then prided themselves like a badge of honor on the things they did outwardly. So they would point to, did you see how much money I gave? Did you see the attendance I logged at the local synagogue? Do you know we haven't missed one of the three pilgrimage festivals in years? Do you see how well we pray? Do you hear the eloquence in our voice? So they pointed to their acts of outward worship and at the same time minimized the attitude of their heart. Now, sadly, we're tempted to do the same thing, right? We're tempted to point to, do you know how much time I spend with the Lord in the morning, right? Have you heard how long I've prayed to God. Have you seen how many mission trips? I mean, I go on mission trips every year. Did you hear the enthusiasm in the worship of the singing this morning? Did you hear me singing? None of you heard me singing, I promise. But, but did you hear me singing, you know, this enthusiasm? Do you see my giving record to the Lord? Have you seen the trips that I've going on, going on overseas? Did you know that I participated in the Make a Difference campaign as well? And what happens is we're tempted to justify our good deeds while minimizing our bad deeds. And here's what I want to show you. All the while we do that, and yet at the same time, we harbor bitterness and anger in our heart on a weekly basis toward other people. We're critical of our spouse. We are overbearing to our children. We are negative online to people around us. We harbor hatred toward another member or another minister on this staff or another pastor or another person in our church. And what happens is it's a works-based legalistic system, if we're not careful, that we get caught up in. We say this to God, God, look at the good I'm doing. Don't look at the bad I'm doing. So we want the good to overshadow our bad. Now, I've said this before, and I just kind of remind you, for those who don't know, we have two boys. Uh, They're 11 and 13. Uh, This week, I was speaking somewhere, and I was telling somebody their names are Rig, R-I-G, and Ryder. And somebody's looking at me. I'm like, yeah, we named them after trucking companies. I get that. You know what I mean? But they're pretty tough. I mean, just like they sound. Anybody ever, anybody have all boys in the home? Any moms raise or are raising all boys. Well, you know the pain, right? You know the struggle, it's real. And so boys are great, but boys tend to get in fist fights a lot. Uh, boys tend to make a lot of different sounds. Uh, <laughs> boys have no manners. But one of the things about boys is every now and then they're gonna, they're gonna come the blows and they're gonna go at it, right? Doesn't happen a lot, but it's happened in the home where Rig will throw a punch or Ryder will hit him or Rig will get him in a headlock or they'll bust a wall or break down a door, which has happened before. And if Candy's home, being mama, nurturing, Candy will immediately run to the boy, like break it up, what are you doing? If I'm home alone, I just turn my head, you know, just. <laughs> Dad, you here? What? What? Yeah. You gotta toughen them up, right? I mean, you know, you gotta toughen. But anyway, so they, 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 and then when you get there and you break them apart, what happens is you say, what are you doing? And, and Rigo said, he punched me in the face. And I'll say, Ryan, did you punch? Yeah, but dad, he, he threw his drink at me. You know, it's like back and forth. And by no means will they take credit for being the person who started, right? So they'll divert attention and say, look here, don't look here. Here's the thing. It's one thing for a child to do that. It's another thing for an adult to do that. Hey, look, I may, I may have slandered that person, but you should have seen the way they talk to me. That's what we say, right? I know I posted something online, but did you see the way they posted about me? And then we do it with sin, which is even more tragic. We'll say, I know I have a porn addiction, but did you see how much money I gave last year to the church? Now, you may not say this publicly, but you say this privately to the Lord. I, I know, I know I'm texting someone in an inappropriate manner, but do you know I'm doing my quiet times every morning? I may not go to church much, but boy, I give faithfully and I still participate in things during the community. Friends, there is a grave danger in justifying one sin by our own good deeds. There is a grave danger with that. You know what Jesus is showing us today? Write this down. The attitude of our heart is way more important than the amount of our offering. Write that down. 
the attitude of our heart toward another person, toward God, toward our spouse, toward our friends, our family, is way more important than the amount of the offering. And I'm not just talking about money offering, I'm talking about the offering of time and talent and treasure to God. God is interested in our heart, which is why the second insight I wanna give you is this. Peace with others precedes the presence of God. And this one will hit the target today because it hit me this week. So this one's gonna land pretty much on everybody in here because it landed on me. Peace with other people precedes the presence of God. Now, I told you earlier that the, the, the word order is very interesting because you would expect God, uh, Jesus to say, if you have something against your brother and you know they treated you long and they talked about you, you need to go to them and say, you hurt me. That's what you would expect. But that's not what he says. Jesus says, if you realize that something you said offended another person, then you go to that brother or sister. So you probably wonder, well, what, what could I have done? What is offensive to other people? Look at verse 21. Matthew chapter five, earlier in your Bible, verse 21. Jesus said, you've heard it said to our ancestors, do not murder. Whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. But whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. Here's what he's saying, watch this. He's saying your attitude toward another person, your insults toward another person, your online comments about another person, and your snarky responses toward another person is what he's talking about. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I did not post that post to offend anyone. I was just sharing what was on my heart. I get that. I get that. But here is what Jesus is saying. If since you sharing, innocently or not, have realized that your post has caused harm to another person, Jesus would say, take it down immediately and go make it right with the person. It's better to be right with man than to be wrong with God. Because if you're wrong with man, Jesus would say, you're actually wrong with God. Here's what red letter Jesus would say today. Don't sing another lyric. Don't raise another hand in worship. Don't open your Bible again. Don't say another prayer. Don't give another time or your time or your talents or your treasures. Don't make another mission trip. Don't go overseas. Don't do another good deed until you make it right with someone you have wronged. Why? Because your attitude toward another person is greater than your offering and the amount to God. You know what he's showing us? He's showing us that we cannot fit our life or cram our life into an offering envelope and give it to God. You can't compartmentalize your heart and text it to 98173. I mean, that's not how, that's not how it works. What he's saying is your heart condition is the most important thing to God. And the way you treat another person who is made in the image of God tells a lot about your relationship with God. Now, let me just warn you, this next section uh, is going to be uh, hard to hear. Uh, it's going to be a little overwhelming, so I want, I want to prepare. You're probably saying, well, up to this point, it's been overwhelming. I get that, but this, this part, this part is going gonna to be a little uncomfortable for you, but I promise you, it will be good for you. You remember earlier when you answered questions publicly with hands, and I asked you, do you want more of God? And what did you say? Yeah. Do you want a clear conscience before God? Yes. Do you want to see the power and presence of God in your life? Yes. Well, this section is important then. See, here's the reality, and I say this with love to you, and again, this sermon's for me too, so let me just say this to you. Some of you this morning came in and sang, praise God from whom all blessings flow, and yet this week you put down and cut down your spouse. and you haven't asked for forgiveness. 
Do you see the hypocrisy there? You see the hypocrisy what Jesus is talking about? You bless God with the lyrics of your mouth and at the same time curse your husband or your wife with your lips. You see, you see the hypocrisy, what he's saying there. Students will come on Wednesday night and they will, they will sing songs to the Savior. And, they're, they're just go, and, and what's crazy is our kids don't sing on Sunday, like mine don't, but they'll sing on Wednesday. Anybody here? Because they're like, y'all don't want to just sing on? Well, Dad, we like our own service and the preachers are better. Okay, I get that, but I mean, <laughs> let's just say, I mean, it's worship, so it's worship. But anyway, they will sing songs to the Savior on Wednesday night and then the next day go to school and slander another student in their class. You see the hypocrisy here. Some of you will raise a hand out of respect to God and yet disrespect your coworker and disrespect your neighbor and never think twice about it. See the hypocrisy here. Some of you are eager to go overseas and tell people about Jesus and preach the gospel and then come back from the trip and have no problem ripping apart other friends or church members or pastors or ministers on this staff or other races and think nothing about it. This is what Jesus would say, stop lying to yourself. You cannot hate another person and claim to love God. You cannot say my devotion is there with God and at the same time, I consistently disrespect other people. You know, God taught me this lesson he talked to me many times, but most recently in 2019, I, I said a couple weeks ago that the, there was a meeting that took place in my life in 2019 with two church members that was kind of the seedbed for the 10 months of 2020 of sitting on the porch with the Lord that led up to, in a sense, I feel like the revival that happened at Long Hollow uh, and we experienced it, which was an amazing season of the Lord. But I talked about that meeting with the two members. And for those who didn't know, I had two church members who I love and friends of mine. They basically came to me over breakfast, two and a half hours, and they said, hey, people think you're arrogant. People think you're selfish. People think it's, you think it's all about you. And it was a blind spot in my life. I didn't see a lot of this. And so when I finished, it was a horrible meeting for me, overwhelming. God used it, obviously, in my life. But I left and uh, me being the Enneagram 3 I am and wanting to please and make people happy, I came back and for the next month of my life, um, I asked for the names of the people they said that were kind of out of sync with me or the church. And for the next month, I met breakfast, lunch, sometimes dinner with 20 people, 20 plus people and I simply just went in and I took a notebook, a journal, and I walked in with a posture of humility and I said, hey, listen, obviously I've got some blind spots in my life. I want you to help me. And I took out a journal and a pen and I said, I'm here to listen. And it was brutal, brutal. There were some people at our church, this was 2019, there were some people that I met with at that season that were bringing up things I had said in 2015. Things like this. My wife remembers the sermon when you said this in 2015, and that's the day she wrote you off. Or I remember uh, 20, 2016, you got up and you wrote a book and you tried to promote it to the church, and I knew that day you were arrogant that day. And, and at the end of the time, I just listened to that, I took notes, and I just said, hey, listen, I, 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 don't, I, I don't remember some of those things and I want you to know I'm here because if I unknowingly or knowingly offended you, I, I wanna ask for your forgiveness. And thankfully, at that time, I was developing a rhythm of sitting with the Lord and I went home that night and as I would sit with the Lord, it was very tempting for me to say things like this. Those people don't know me. Actually, they're the ones in the wrong, really. They, they're the ones, Lord, who should apologize. I mean, that's what the flesh, that's what I wanted to say about people that would say these things about me, but I decided to take a different posture. And by the way, this is not natural for a human being to want to do. So I, I needed God to work in my life. And here's what I began to do. I began to pray and I said, God, would you soften my heart and help me love these people? Because I knew in myself, I couldn't do it. 
I didn't want to love them. I, I wanted to retaliate. And, you know, I felt like they were, might not have been enemies, but they felt like enemies against me at the time. But I began to pray. God softened my heart so I could love these people. And then I began to pray for God to bless them. What I'm going to share with you right now is what I believe the superpower for a Christian is. Now, just full disclosure, I went back and forth. Should I share my secret I've learned 10 years ago? With the, and then if I share it, it's no longer a secret. And some of you are going to say, you did this to me. <laughs> And so I hate to share, but I thought, you know what? I want to share it because obviously the Lord taught it to me, but I want to share it now. And let me, just, let me just preface it. It is not easy to do. It is not easy to do. And everything in your being wants to do just the opposite. Because when you're wrong like me, I want to retaliate. Who do you think, who do you, think you are? I used to joke with my parents and say, God took a guy who when people would look at him with a raised eyebrow was ready on a dime to fight. That was me. And now he softened and transformed my heart to when people convict me or confront me, the only thing I want to do is respond with love and blessings and praise. And I'm like, it has to be God. But here's the secret. I'm telling you how it works. Write this down. And here's the secret. It is the superpower for a Christian. Make a note to be, that's your motto, a dealer of compassion not a dispenser of criticism. It's your posture. When you are hurt, you deal compassion. When you are wrong, you give back grace. When you are slandered, you give back love. Now, like I said, it's, it's not easy to do, it's difficult to do, but, but here's the principle I want you to get. Why would you do that? And here's what the Lord showed me. When I step in and try to fix things or make things right or justify or minimize or, or tell why I did it, what happens is God steps back. Watch this. When I step in, God steps back. And he says, hey, big boy, you got it. You have it. You can obviously do better than me. You take it. And then God steps back. And here's what the Lord showed me. When I respond to the Facebook post, when I respond to the Twitter comment, when I go back to the people who are criticizing me online for something that I think, I don't, I don't even know what they're talking about, then I'm the one who they can attack. Because they say, well, Robbie responded this way. Robbie said this. Or Robbie did. But when, watch this. When you step back, God steps in and God brings to the table a tactic that you and I do not have in our toolbox. And here it is. The tactic is conviction. Conviction. And so here's the posture. If someone is criticizing you online, if someone is sending out negative text about you, if someone is talking about you at school, if someone is making negative comments about you on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, if your coworkers are laughing about you, listen, step back and let God step in. Listen, your job is not to make things right. Your, you and I's job is to reconcile with people we have wronged. God has that part. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad God's going to make things right one day? Our job is to reconcile with him. And so here's the question as we close. And I know some of you right now are just thinking, man, I need a, I need a call. I need to call that person right after service. Brother, who did you wrong that just comes to mind right now that the, the Lord's bringing to mind that you need to make right? You need to call and ask for forgiveness. Sister, who is it that maybe you intentionally or unintentionally hurt that you need to reach out to and say, hey, I need to ask for your forgiveness. Here's what's cool about the Holy Spirit, and this is amazing. He has the amazing ability, if you ask him honestly, to put his finger on the person you need to call. It's amazing how he does that, if you're honest. And so in just a few moments, we're gonna have a time of response. We're gonna spend time before the Lord, and we're gonna ask the Lord, who is it I need to reconcile with? Now, here's the deal. When you call after the service or text that person, you are not calling and saying, hey, listen, if I said something to you uh, to make you feel a certain way, man, I am sorry. But if you did that, listen, don't even make the call. Not even worth you calling. In the call, this is the line that has to be shared. This is the line. I am asking for forgiveness for something I have done against you. 
Will you forgive me? And there's ownership there. Now, let me flip, let me flip this around. There are some in here who have been deeply hurt by another person. And it may be someone in this room, it may be someone in our church, maybe someone in your family, and your worship has been affected because you have harbored anger and bitterness and resentment. And so here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm not saying you call them and say, hey, you, you, you hurt me. I'm asking you to bring it to Jesus today and say, God, I forgive them in my heart and I'm gonna move on. My worship to you and my intimacy with you is way too important than anger and feelings that I'm harboring for years and years and years toward my mom, my sister, my brother, my relatives, my coworkers, my kids. I'm just gonna ask you right now. So right now, uh, as every head is bowed, every eye closed, I'm gonna ask you, if you need to make it right, I'm gonna ask you to come, why? Because you're gonna need God to go before you it's not easy. Pastor Robert, I hadn't talked to this person in three years. I know. That's why the Holy Spirit has to go before you. And so you're going to come and ask the Lord, would you go before me before I make this call? And here's the challenge. Do not put off tomorrow what has to be done today. Do not put it off. So I'm going to ask you to come. If you're here today and you're saying, man, I've got bitterness and anger and resentment in my heart, and I need God to take it away just a moment, I'm going to ask you to come as well. Father, I pray right now. Father, I pray that you give us the grace to respond to people the way you have. When you were attacked, you didn't say a word. When you were hit and whipped, and made to bear a cross that did not have your name on it for sins that you committed, you didn't say a word. You simply said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And the great thing about you is, in the end, you are vindicated. In the end, you win. The battle has been one, God, we're not out to win an argument, God. We're out to reconcile with people who are made in your image. And so give us the courage this morning. Give us the grace to do that, God, as we spend time with you, bowing and listening. Would you bring to mind the exact person in our lives whom we have wronged that we need to seek to make it right? God, help us to spend time at your feet, to return to worship again. We ask it in Jesus' name.